the, uh, uh, just real quickly, because I always run out of time, I'll have to do it quickly just to get us up to speed where we're at this week. Uh, we, we talked about the fact that the gospel is God's plan for transformation. God wants us to be transformed. That's his plan. And uh, we talked about some of the scriptural bases for that uh, in Galatians and Romans and Ephesians. Ephesians says, but that isn't what you learned about Christ since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Listen to this. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So the plan of God is for us to be transformed. And uh, we too, we talked about the fact that Jesus came along and he gave us the correct yardstick for determining whether or not we are transformed. He came along with a new system of measurement. He asked us the real question. Am I increasingly loving God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength? Am I increasingly loving my neighbors, myself? Am I increasingly loving other Christians the way Jesus loved the disciples? And we talked about the fact that that's really the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. And you'll notice I didn't say anything in there about not sinning. See, so many times when we talk about transformation, we think we're talking about we got good sinning. Well, a rock doesn't sin, but it's also not Christ-like. So being like Christ doesn't mean that we just don't do wrong stuff. Jesus' life was not characterized by the fact he didn't sin as much as by what he did do. That he loved the Father, that he loved people. And so when we talk about transformation, we're not talking about just eliminating the seven deadly sins or something. We're talking about being transformed into the kind of person that God designed us to be and created us to be. In week three, we talked about the fact that simply trying harder wouldn't get us there. Uh, that instead, we need to learn to train. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old lifestyles. Rather, train yourself to be godly. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we learn to train ourselves? What, what does training mean when it comes to godliness? And quite simply, it means just learning from Jesus how to live. That Jesus knew how to live, he showed us how to live, and then we learned from him how to live. And that's a little general, it can be a little vague, and so in order to make that more precise, we talk about some of the practices that we see in Scripture. And, uh, and identify the things that were part of Jesus' life, and part of Paul's life, part of the life of the saints of the Old Testament. And we refer to those as spiritual disciplines, or uh, you'll hear the phrase, Jesus habits. You may hear it referred to as soul training, or spiritual practices. And these are the kind of things that we can do that lead us into the life that God wanted us to have. Well, the minute we start talking about those things, we have to be careful that we understand what they're not. And, and these practices we're talking about are not a measure of our spirituality. You say, this, you said that like three times. Well, I said 50 more times than everybody will find me hear me. Because it is so easy to drift into thinking, this is how I become a good Christian. I become a good Bible reader. I become a good prayer. Well, you've heard us say more than once, uh, those things are important, but they're means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. And as long as we think they're an end in themselves, we'll get, go astray because we think we're real spiritual because we're doing those things. That's why the earlier session starting last year would be an interactive relationship with God through prayer. An interactive relationship with God through bodily. See, the focus always be in entering into relationship with God. And these are just vehicles by which we'll do it. And so very important. They're not a way we earn favor with God. Uh, he's not up there awarding brownie points based on how we do that. So week four, we talked about what is a spiritual discipline. And uh, there are some that come to mind readily. Reading your Bible, praying, meditating on the scripture, those, those kind of jump out at us most of the time. But basically a spiritual discipline is any activity that can help me gain power to live the way Jesus taught and modeled life. That's something that helps me live in the fruit of the Spirit. The Apostle John wrote, he said, this is how we can know we are in God. Anyone who claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. 
Well, if uh, you were walking as another person did, you would learn pretty quickly what you need to do. And what you need to do is you live the way they're living. And so if we'll walk as Jesus did, then what we need to do is walk and live as he lived. We talk about the fact that a disciplined person is not one who does the disciplines well. It's not about becoming a good discipline doer, and, uh, but it is about training with wisdom. And in order to train with wisdom, we have to understand the Holy Spirit's at work. We respect the freedom of the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit of God will lead us in these processes and will look different from one person to another because wise training also respects our unique temperament and our gifts. We uh, recognize that we're not all wired the same and it will look different for some of us than for others. And it takes into account our season of life. It doesn't matter where we're at, uh, whether we're retired or whether we're getting ready to graduate from high school. Wherever we're at, the season of life is a time that we can enter into the life of God. And then finally, last week we talked about why this training begins with a clear decision. That's so crucial because we won't just drift into a life of training. I saw in Mike Zilch, Mike got a knee replacement and he's been going through physical therapy and they're doing therapy exercises and now he'll start doing outpatient therapy. Well, you don't just kind of wander into doing therapy to get your range of motion back. You learn some things to do and you make it, you make it your mind. I want to walk again. And then you get intentional about it. And so when we talk about training, we have to interject that. Well, the truth is, the first four weeks were pretty frustrating for me because I said, I'm not telling you how to do anything. I'm just telling you, in general, what it's not and what it is. And so this week is uh, exciting because we'll actually talk about one of the forms of training. We talked about uh, what disciplines are not, and one of the things we said they're not is they're not necessarily unpleasant. And I believe that's absolutely true. And so this week, we'll talk about uh, one of the spiritual disciplines, one of the Jesus habits, one of the spiritual practices called the practice of celebration. I was at a uh, Hispanic church last weekend for a Saturday night, men's banquet, and Sunday morning. And uh, all I can tell you is those people really knew how to celebrate. I mean, it was just exciting to be there with them and, and just having a good time. And, and they loved God and man, I said they didn't, but uh, just a, a real spirit of celebration about them. And uh, so this practice of celebration is just one of the disciplines. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought I was just reading my Bible and praying, you know, uh, having a party. It's one of the spiritual disciplines. That may sound strange to some of you, but I have to confess, it's not one that I do very well. I don't celebrate well. I, I, this is why I'm not intentional about it. I just won't enter into it because I'm just way too serious. I don't know that. I had a friend of mine in California, she mailed me a uh, finger puppet. I don't know if you've ever seen a finger puppet. It fits on the end of your finger. I can't do this, Jason, with a microphone in my hand. But, uh, and, and this one's got a real funny face. It's got two little arms that stick up like this. And if you put it on your finger and you wiggle it, the arms do this. <laughs> well, sometimes when two lawyers are sitting there just going at it in my office, they're yin at each other. And then I'm just about losing my mind. Sometimes I get that finger puppet, and I'm just putting on my finger and shaking it. I'm just shaking. And uh, they look at me like, man, you are crazy. Well, it gives me a chance to say, look, let's put that to yourself pretty serious. Let's take a breath here. Uh, well, that's why it's on my desk to remind myself, don't take yourself so serious. Learn to laugh. Learn to enjoy life. Uh, I think Jesus was a very happy person. I just don't think he walked around looking like he'd been sucking on lemons all day and uh, acting real religious that way. So the uh, thing we'll share tonight is this idea of celebration, why it's important, and how to do it. Because if you're like me, you don't really know much about celebrating sometimes. Uh, I grew up poor. We had a lot of kids, and uh, I thought it was a pretty good night. And everybody had some meat on their plate. You know, that, that, was, a good, that was a good meal. And... Uh, so, if, if you're looking at the outline, the first key point there is, it says joy is the serious business of heaven. A quote from C.S. Lewis, a very profound writer. He says joy is the serious business of heaven. That, that's in intended to kind of catch your attention. It's like joy and serious business don't seem to go together. But we serve a very joyful God. 
this idea of what do you think of when you think of God is very important because I think sometimes it's hard for us to imagine God smiling, much less laughing. That he's this big, serious, whatever you want to say. And we think that's the way God is, and we think that's the way we ought to be. But uh, I believe it's true that we serve a very joyful God. Dallas Willard wrote his thoughts on God's joyfulness, and he said this. He said, while I was teaching in South Africa some time ago, a young man named Matthew Dixon took me out to see the beaches near his home in Port Elizabeth. I was totally unprepared for the experience. I understand now it's those in California. They got some beaches. He said, I had seen beaches, or so I thought. But when we came over the rise where the sea and land opened up to us, I stood in silence and then slowly walked through the waves. Words cannot capture the view that confronted me. I saw space and light and texture and color and power that seemed hardly of this earth. Gradually, there crept into my mind the realization that God sees this all the time. He sees it, experiences it, knows it from every possible point of view. This and billions of other scenes, like and unlike, in this and billions of other worlds. Great tidal waves of joy must constantly wash through his being. It is perhaps strange to say, he writes, but suddenly, I was extremely happy for God. And though I had some sense of what an infinitely joyous consciousness he is, and of what it might have meant for him to look at his creation and say, it's very good. He said, we pay a lot of money to get a tank with a few tropical fish in it, and never tire of looking at their brilliant colors and marvelous forms and movements. But God has seen something which he constantly enjoys. So he just gives you this perspective of God just looking at this giant aquarium and seeing these beautiful fish that he created. Boy, it is good. And just the joy that comes from it. The same way we might sit and look at a tank full of guppies on a very small scale. And so, if we realize that God is, in fact, a very joyous being, then it begins to change how we see him, how we think, we think he sees us. Now, admittedly, he knows sorrow, because in addition to the aquariums of the world, he, uh, the scripture tells us Jesus is a man of sorrows. But for God, sorrow is a temporary response to a fallen world. Joy is God's basic character. It's his eternal destiny. He's the happiest being in the universe. And if we see God as a joyful God, then we can begin to see what he calls us to become, a joyful people. I talked about, in the second point, that joy and gratitude are first cousins. I'm going to tell you, it's really hard to be joyful if you're not grateful. And it's hard to be grateful if you're not joyful. These two things fit together. We're told in Scripture that we're to rejoice evermore. Some of y'all have been around long enough to used to sing it, if you won't try. Rejoice evermore. Yeah, does it. Uh, rejoice evermore, for this is the will of God, in Christ Jesus, concerning you. Uh, rejoice evermore. Well, that, that's a little challenging sometimes, because things are going on around us that we don't rejoice about. But we can rejoice evermore because every moment of life is a gift of grace from God. We don't earn it. We don't control it. We should take a moment of it for granted. I go get a haircut uh, once a month, and where I go, there's a lady that washes your hair, and then another lady cuts your hair. The lady that cuts, washes my hair is Miss Francis. I've known Miss Francis for years. And I always ask her, I say, Miss Francis, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just so blessed. God is so good to me. God is so good to me. And Miss Francis doesn't get along very good. She has a walking stick. Sometimes I look at her and think, my gosh, she's awful. Far along in life, happy down here. 
washing hair. And I know she's not a wealthy lady. I know she's got some kids and grandkids that have given her some gray hairs, but she's got some that are doing real well. And every time I ask Miss Francis how she's doing, she's like, oh, God, it's so good to me. It's so good to me. And she just has this infectious spirit of gratitude. And from that comes joy. Because she finds so many things to be grateful for. And really, sometimes I'd be careful because I'll be the theologian in the church. And she'll be grateful for something. I'm just thinking, God didn't do that. Why are you grateful for it? Thank you, God, for that. You didn't do that. That's but she doesn't care. She doesn't care about theology. She just finds what there is to be grateful for, and she's grateful. And she has a joyous spirit. And she, I always feel better after I, I hear her talking about her life. And so we have to, to recognize the role that gratitude plays. And it's real easy if we let gratitude slip away to see joy slip away at the same time. So hopefully we recognize that when God said rejoice evermore, it wasn't just a suggestion. It was his invitation into life. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. But maybe God expects his people, just like he's the happiest, joyful being in the universe, he expects his people to be the most joyous people. And so, if so, how do we do that? Because, folks, this is where the trying harder, where you see so clearly it doesn't work. Have you just ever tried to be joyful? Hmm. It's pretty hard. This way you're going, I'm going to be joyful. Oh, gosh. More and more. And then uh, you ever have somebody that is joyful and they just irritate you. You're like, man, that's pretty joyful. I'm not joyful. Uh, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't have a good day today. <laughs> that didn't skip. I had a horrible day today. I came into the house, walked down and said, man, that's one of the worst days I've had in a long time. Uh, so I, I'm going down here and speaking on joy tonight. I'm so excited about it. Oh, wow. And a celebration. And I'm just thinking, when the sun goes down, I'm going to celebrate because this day will be over. And I'm thinking about this Francis. God is so good to me. God is so good to me. So how do we do that? If we're not going to be joyful by trying harder, then we have to learn to be joyful by training. Training. Don't pay attention to the godless myths and no wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. God is joyful. So we're going to be godly. We're going to be joyful. So how do we train ourselves to be godly? I want to just talk to you about some what I think are very practical things on how to get serious about joy. Uh, it's important to recognize that uh, when we're talking about being serious about joy, we're talking about being like our Father, who's a joyful God. Now, sometimes uh, we, we may not see God as that joyful, and we think he kind of goes about his business the way we may go about ours. John Ortberg, in his book, he writes the story of how it might have looked if God approached his job the way we approach ours. And he writes this. He says, in the beginning, it was 9 o'clock, so God had to go to work. He filled out a requisition to separate light from darkness. He considered making stars to beautify the night and planets to fill the skies, but it sounded like too much work, and besides, thought God, that's not my job. So he decided to knock off early and call it a day. He looked at what he had done, and he said, it'll have to do on the second day, God separated the waters from the dry land, and he made all the dry land flat, plain, and functional, so that behold, the whole earth looked like Idaho. He's <laughs> from Idaho, I'm sorry. I didn't write that. Uh, he thought about making mountains and valleys and glaciers and jungles and forests, but he decided it wouldn't be worth the effort. And God looked at what he had done that day and said, it'll have to do. And God made a pigeon to fly in the air and a carp to swim in the waters and a cat to creep upon dry ground. And God thought about making millions of other species of all sizes and shapes and colors, but he couldn't drum up any enthusiasm for any other animals. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about the cat. Besides, it was almost time for the late show. So God looked at all he'd done and God said, it'll have to do. And at the end of the week, God was seriously burned out. So he breathed a big sigh of relief and said, thank me, it's Friday. 
Well, of course, Genesis doesn't look anything like that, does it? Instead, you see a joyful God saying, let it be, and it was so, and he looked at it and said, it's very good. I mean, have you just stopped and thought about just the number of butterflies and the different shapes and the colors? And can't you just see God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit going, Monarch! And it flew out and he said, oh, it's very good. Well, let's not stop there. Let's make some more. And then we got all the flowers and the birds. And, and you see the joy of the creation coming forth. And so when we see God that way, then it's a little easier for us to start talking about what we need to do. And the first thing I have in there is to be intentional about celebration. Be intentional about celebration. Now, that's really important because I told you a spiritual discipline, a soul training, a Jesus habit, uh, is something we can do in order to produce what we can't do. I can't just drum up joy, but there's some things I can do. And uh, that's when we talk about these practices, that's what we're talking about doing. We're talking about being intentional. And this week, an intentional in celebration. If you read in uh, Nehemiah 8, 10, this is where I'm talking about rebuilding the wall, and this is what it says in Nehemiah 8, 10. It says, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved. And we'll recognize the ending of this verse. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, he doesn't say, just get a fun and let God pour some joy into you. He says, have a party. Have a feast. I think Earl would agree. Isn't that Jewish for a party? A feast? All right. He says, have a party. And he says, eat the fat. Well, what's that mean? Well, I mean, it sounds good to me, eating fat. But really, he's just talking about eat the, eat the good meat. Eat the good foods. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy what God created for you. Some of you have heard me pray over a meal before, and some of them I pray. My prayer is that. I don't just thank God for the food. I thank God that he gave me taste buds. You know, are you glad? You feel the difference between salty and sweet? And, you know, he gave you taste buds? Where do you think they came from? They come from a um, gorilla or something? They gave, God gave you taste buds so you can enjoy different flavors and textures. And, and when we enter into celebration, we do that. We celebrate the goodness of God and what God has done for us. And it's so important because we have to recognize that joy is strength. And in the absence, we have nothing but weakness. Again, Dallas Wood writes these words. He says, failure to attain a deeply satisfying life always has the effect of making sinful actions seem good. Here's what I said. Failure to attain a deeply satisfying life. Failure to enter into the life God wants you to have. Always makes sinful actions seem good. Here, he writes, here lies the strength of temptation. Normally, our success in overcoming temptation will be easier if we're basically happy in our lives. To cut off the joys and pleasures associated with our bodily lives and social existence is unspiritual then can actually have the effect of weakening us in our efforts to do what's right. So God intended for us to enjoy all of And sometimes in the church, we just say anything that's good has got to be a seed, so we can't enjoy it all. And God comes on and says, no, what we want you to do is arrange your life in a way that sin no longer looks attractive. So we get to that point where we enter into what God wants us to have, and, and it's like, well, wouldn't you rather go eat a mud pie? No, I don't think so. I'd rather eat the goodness of God. See, so uh, what we begin to do is recognize that just like Nehemiah instructed the people, we enter into celebration. So what does that mean? I mean, we're not going to have a Jewish feast necessarily, but what does it mean? Well, it means we'll be intentional about it. Be strategic about it. Nehemiah was telling him, don't just wander around and hope you have a feast someday. Plan it. Do it. 
Stop what you're doing. Be intentional about it. Implement it into your life. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And, you know, unfortunately in the church, we think the only thing spiritual is fasting. Well, feasting is spiritual, too. Sometimes we can gain as much about feasting as we do about fasting. Now, do you need to do both? Yeah, fasting is under spiritual discipline, but then we'll start out with that one. We'll be out the room too quick. But, uh, but celebration, feasting, it's just as much transformational because it's entered into the joy that God wants us to have. But understand, we don't feast the way the world feasts. Because the way the world feasts is we just demand more and more and more for personal gratification. And it doesn't work because our joy diminishes. Uh, you know, we don't eat a lot of stuffed crust pepperoni pizza in my house. Uh, at least I don't think honey's around. Uh, well, you know, sometimes I get a hold of something I just shouldn't eat. I went to Beaumont the other day by myself, and uh, so I thought I'll go somewhere to eat that Connie wouldn't go with me. So we went to this, uh, we, I, uh, I'm <laughs> trying to share the blame, right? We went to this uh, Chinese buffet over at Gateway Shopping Center. If you had a tablespoon of each dish, you couldn't have walked out of there. I mean, it's a massive amount of food. And I was so excited because I was eating all this Chinese buffet food that I wasn't eating for them. And uh, I tell you, by the time I got my third plate, it wasn't even good anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. I was like, dude, I spent all this money, and uh, I don't get this stuff all the time. And the more I ate, the less I enjoyed it. Well, that's the way the world feeds. See, and we can't figure out why we don't get anything out of it. And instead, it's just counterproductive, and the joy diminishes. But instead, when we celebrate, we got what God wants us to celebrate, we exercise our ability to see and feel goodness in the most simple of God's gifts. It's so important. We exercise our ability to see and feel goodness in the most simple of God's gifts. Celebration. What is celebration? Celebration, one writer says, is this. Celebration is utter delight and joy in ourselves, our lives, our world, as a result of our faith and confidence in God's greatness, beauty, and goodness. Utter delight and joy in ourselves, our lives, our world, as a result of our faith and confidence in God's greatness, God's beauty. God's goodness. One of the big celebrations at my house is uh, eating dinner in the backyard. We've got a little garden area, and um, especially this time of year, it's kind of cool outside, and, and I'll cook something on the grill, and uh, we'll, we'll sit out there, we've got a little table, two chairs, we're not invited, one for Connie, one for me, uh, this is a little celebration. And uh, we'll sit out there, and i got a little water feature I can turn on, hear the water running. And the gardens are beautiful, kind of plant all these flowers and things are cool. And, and, and we sit out there and enjoy a meal. And sometimes when it's cool enough, I can light a fire in my fire pit and look at the fire and look at the stars. And, and that's a celebration, that's a feast day. But you know what? If I'm not intentional, if I'm not strategic, all of a sudden I realize we hadn't done that in six months. And we enjoy it so much, we get life from it. It reminds us the goodness of God. Just sitting in the back yard looking at a fire and looking up at the stars. And just, it'll sound crazy. One night I was sitting in the back yard and I was looking at the moon. And I thought, you know, that's the same moon Jesus looked at. Maybe that sounds a little oversimple to you. But uh, he looked at that moon. Of course, it was 2,000 years younger uh, when he was on earth looking at it. I don't know how young it was when he created it. I was sitting there just looking up the moon. When Jesus sat on the earth and he looked up at the sky. Stars. And, and see, for some of you are going, my God, that, that, I'd rather really have a tooth pulled and sit out there. Well, that's good. That's not your feast day. That's not your celebration. See, but for me it is, but nonetheless, as much as I get out of it, life will crowd it away. That's why I talk about being intentional in practices. I was visiting with a guy recently, and, and he's going through a tragic loss in his life. Tragic. I, I can't fathom it. We meet once a week and just talk. And I asked him, with him I said, what, what really gives life to you? What, what breathes life in your soul? Well, he's religious enough. He knew he was supposed to read his Bible or something. But, but he didn't. He said, sitting on my back porch playing my guitar tonight. 
me really. I said, how long has it been since you did that? It's a long, long time. I said, well, good. That's your assignment this week. So we'll be back to the porch. How are you going to talk about? We'll talk about it next week. So it was a time of celebration for me. Actually, Matt went, and it went well for me. It was uh, a time I think God ministered to him. So recognize that this idea of a celebration doesn't happen by accident. Don't just wander into it. Second is start now. Start now. For too many of us, we're waiting for life to start somewhere down the road. Scripture says this. This is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad. It doesn't say yesterday was the day or tomorrow will get around to being the day. But today is the day that the Lord has made. And so we rejoice. And if we're not careful, we divide our life, I do, into two categories. One category is when I'm living. And the other category is when I'm waiting to live. I fell into that thinking when I got sick around Thanksgiving. I got a respiratory infection and just hung on and, and got some pneumonia. And just really, for weeks and weeks and weeks, I was sick. And then I started getting well. I got shingles. And, and all of a sudden, I realized about a month ago, I was spending my whole life waiting to get well. And life was running past. I said, I mean, you know, we hadn't sat in the backyard. We hadn't enjoyed a meal together out there. Uh, life just ran past us. I was waiting to live somewhere down the road. Oh, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. You don't get it back. So what do we do when we talk about celebration? Let's talk about starting now. Because when we choose to wait, listen to me. When we choose to wait, we reinforce a false narrative that joy will come when the conditions change. The joy will come when the conditions change. When we're waiting to live, we're saying that joy is not possible today. Joy will come when. Now, there, there certainly is a time of mourning. There's a time of grieving. You know, with what happened in Oklahoma and the death toll. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, ah, it just weighs so heavy on me. As I know it has when you go. The children, uh, it just is. I got a text last night from a friend of mine that lives out of state in Iowa, and her little niece has been terminal, and she was going to die. And uh, she's been on the waiting list for a little. And the morning after the Oklahoma disaster, they got a call, they got a pediatric liver. And uh, they rushed her to the hospital and transplanted that liver. And I'm watching her now to see the taste and it goes well. And I'm going to realize that even in the midst of the tragedy, in the midst of the heartbreak, yet we have this reminder from God that even in death, He brings life to him. And, and she wrote a very uh, painful email for me to read where she was talking about the bittersweet feeling they were having, that, that her niece was living, but she knew she might die. Well, the truth is, when we talk about joy, Joy in this world is always in spite of something. It's always in spite of something. It's always in spite of a new ache and pain you found. Uh, this morning it was in spite of the fact that I found the hair growing out of my earlobe, right? I didn't even think the hair was grew. Right? So, man, get, oh my God, I got a hair growing out of my earlobe. There's always something. From something very minor that can upset us. To something very tragic and gut wrenching. But God says that joy is always available to us, even in spite of something. And so, what do we do? We don't wait for things to change, we start now. Third, get some help from somebody that's joyful. Don't come see me about it. This isn't my strong suit. I'm sitting in the movie theater with my grandson a while back watching a movie, and I don't usually laugh at movies. I may smile if it's funny. And, uh, I laughed at something, and, it, and my grandson said, Bob, you don't laugh very often. Oh, man, I hate that. I need to practice laughing. Uh, but, you know, there's some people that are just joyful people when you're around them. You know they're joyful. But there's some value just being around some happy people sometimes. Because other people are out there, too. Trust me, you don't mind nothing them. But uh, just be around some, some happy people. Ask them. I bet there were, I see people that smile a lot. I asked them, I said, what are you smiling about? 
Uh, some of them, they're not, I don't know, they're Christians. But I say, you know, every time I see the grass, they're smiling. Why are you so happy? Because I want to learn from people. I want to learn. And joyful people can help us learn to become more joyful. And being around them can help us become more joyful. So we recognize that, that we may need some help. And then set aside, I, I say there a day a week. You may have to start with a partial day. You like may be so crazy, you got to start with an hour. But set aside some time to do what is good for you. <clears throat> to eat foods that you love, to listen to music that moves your soul, to read books that refresh your spirit, to surround yourself with beauty. <clears throat> and as you do, thank God for his goodness. So set aside some time. Just be intentional about that. Reflect on God's graciousness and see how that works for you. And then the last two things, I'll close with these two quickly, is one is unplug for a day. I, I, I can't look preach a little bit. I just think we've gotten crazy with uh, so much electronics and so much media and so much entertainment. And uh, so a real serious recommendation for increase your joy is just the way you might pass from food. Just fast from those things. Just turn off the TV for an evening. Uh, talk. Listen. Enjoy yourself. Uh, unplug from email accounts, and your text accounts, and your Facebook accounts, your Twitter accounts. And, and just unplug some. That's a challenge for me. I'm going to tell you things I do exceedingly well. But the times I do it, it brings exceeding joy to my life. So I encourage you, pick one of these things and try it. And then finally, get an eternal perspective. I think this is so crucial because I said it's always joy in spite of something. So in between what happens to us and our response stands our beliefs or interpretation of those events. And the people in the New Testament understood joy very well because they were looking at life through the lens of a risen Savior. They were looking in light of the kingdom. They were looking in light of the fact that Jesus came and he showed us we can live in the kingdom. We can do it now and death will not stop us. It won't even slow us down. That Jesus rose again just to show you that death's not even going to speak on. And so we begin to look through that lens of eternity. And that's what Paul was saying when he wrote and he said, Therefore we don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Yet inwardly we're beginning to renew day by day. For our light and momentary affliction is achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Therefore, this is what he says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, as temporary, but what is unseen. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. That's an eternal perspective. And within that eternal perspective, it allows us to see the events that come and pass through that correct understanding of eternity and our response changes. And we learn we can enter into the reality of joy in spite of a lot of secrets. But one day, one day, we read the close of Revelation that he'll wipe away the tears. There'll be no more sickness and no death. We'll gather around the throne and we'll celebrate a way that's unfettered by enlightening anything. Father God, allow us to know the joy of the Lord that truly is our strength. Hmm. Allow us to be intentional and strategic about entering into that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you.